welcome you all to today's class on electron diffraction and imaging. Today we will discuss about uh, coherence. What is the importance of coherence in this particular course? Uh, we know that diffraction is a phenomenon okay, for which we have to invoke the concept of wave nature of the probe and that too for diffraction to take place we assume that the beam is coherent and the scattering is elastic. So, what do we mean by coherence and uh, this is what we should understand. Okay. Once we understand this, okay, we can tell what is the condition under which the diffraction will take place okay. or we can say that what is the condition under which interference will take place. What we mean by coherence is that if a wave has got the same uh, frequency as well as the same phase relationship or there is a definite uh, uh, lag or lead of phase then we say that the beam is coherent. In such cases the amplitude of the waves can be added up to find out the net amplitude of the uh, resultant wave. The details of it is given in this which you can go through and read and understand. Okay. But I am just illustrating what is coherence with the help of an example. Here what we have what we are considering is a wave which has a particular amplitude A and a particular wavelength which is associated with it. Okay. Another wave is also emanating from the source or that wave also has got the same amplitude and the phase, okay, the same amplitude and the same wavelength okay. and if you look at the phase at the initial point both of them has got that same phase. Okay. So, everywhere if you look at it here that uh, has a maximum the phase if you look at it at every point of this wave both of them will have the same phase relationship. Okay. So, or we can say that there is no difference in phase between these two waves. This is one condition and the other condition essentially is that uh, this wave if we consider the amplitude remains that same, the wavelength is exactly that same. Only thing is that with respect to 2, one is lagging a little bit. So, between these two if you look at it, the phase difference is always a has a got a constant value. So, both the cases we can say that the beam is perfectly coherent. In these two cases if you wanted to find out what is going to be the resultant uh, uh, amplitude of the resultant wave, then we can just add up the amplitude at every distance in x. Okay. In this uh, along that x axis whatever the distance we can add what is the amplitude in both the cases add to them that gives the resultant amplitude. This is what will be shown in the next few slides and it will be illustrated how we get the resultant amplitude. But two coherences which we have to consider, okay. one is called as a temporal coherence and another is called as the spatial coherence. Okay. We will discuss what is the difference between these two coherences, uh, uh, what is the importance or significance of these in electron microscopy. We are just taking an example of constructive and restrictive interference. Okay. Here we are considering a wave okay, which has got a particular uh, with respect to time now we are uh, trying to draw that and uh, this wave is represented the wave function psi 1 equals a into cos 2 pi k 1 into x okay. and the other wave is represented okay, also with psi 2 equals a into cos 2 pi k 1 into x. So, there is uh, the phase difference between these two waves is 0. The resultant wave if you look at it is essentially has got amplitude which has doubled okay, because how we can write it is psi 1 plus psi 2 when we can write it that will become just 2 a cos uh, uh, pi into k 1 into x and the amplitude has just doubled. So, if you look at the intensity that intensity will be the square of this where we find that compared to the particular wave the amplitudes have increased and what we should notice here is that here we are first adding the amplitudes okay, and then finding out the intensity and this is uh, how we define 
uh, uh, for a coherent beam. For a coherent beam, amplitudes are added and then the resultant intensity is found out. In the case of an incoherent wave, as we have mentioned earlier, uh, intensity of each of the wave is found out and then they are added together. Okay. Then we are considering an another case where uh, that wave uh, is the same as that uh, first case, but the second case we have introduced a phase shift of uh, plus pi. When this phase shift has been introduced to this wave, okay, and now if we look at the uh, amplitude psi 2, it becomes minus a into cos 2 pi k 1 x. Okay. And these two waves when we add together, the net amplitude, okay, if we look at it, okay, it turns out to be 0. That means that in this case, there is a complete destructive interference has taken place. Okay. That wave has uh, just vanished, there is no fluctuations. Okay. So, this we call it as a destructive interference. Normally, most of the cases when we talk of uh, the two cases which we have considered, we assume that this wave has got a wavelength lambda or lambda 1. Essentially, this is the wavelength of a radiation okay, which is an ideal case. Okay. But normally, most of the radiation has got a line width associated with it okay. and the line width essentially tells how much is the spread in the wavelength. So, this could be some value delta lambda which we can take it. Okay. That is what the reality of the situation is. So, if though we call that the beam is monochromatic, but when it has a slight wavelength associated with it, then it is equivalent to considering at an extreme case one with a wavelength lambda 1 and another wavelength with lambda 1 plus delta lambda, this is equal to lambda 2 as if two waves with these two wavelengths. And assume that both are emanating from that same point, originating from that same point and that is what it is being shown here. But as it propagates, we can see that since the uh, wavelength is different, gradually we can see that there is a small phase shift which is occurring. Okay. After they have travelled a particular distance, we can find out that the uh, phase shift has become pi and in this case the waves completely uh, disappear and a destructive interference is taking place. Okay. In one definition this distance is called as the this distance is called as half of the coherence length and that this time is called as uh, uh, no this distance is called as twice the coherence length and this distance is called as twice the coherence uh, time. We can just find find out uh, an expression for this coherence length and the coherence time and that is what we are trying to do. Okay. For which what we are assuming that there are two waves are there which is uh, 1 psi 1 equals a sin 2 pi k 1 x okay. that psi 2 with uh, sin 2 pi only thing is that that k2 is that k vector. So, k1 and k2 are two different wave vectors and uh, this is corresponding wavelength lambda 1 and lambda 2. Okay. And we assume that the difference between the wavelengths are extremely small. And the other assumption which we make is that both the waves are travelling in the uh, same direction. Okay. And then if you try to find out the uh, instant in the resultant amplitude of the wave at its uh, that formula turns out to be the sin equals a sin 2 pi k 1 x plus the, then using this uh, trigonometric uh, identities we can uh, find out the expression for the net wave. Okay. The resultant wave amplitude turns out to be 2 pi k 1 plus cos 2 pi k 1 square 2 by 2. Okay. This is what it turns out to be 
the amplitude of the resultant wave. Okay. Since k1 and k2 are very close by, we can assume this to be equal to k1 plus k2 by 2 to be equal to uh, k by 2. Okay. If we take that, then this becomes a into sin r k1 by 2 pi k1 by 2. k1 minus k2 by 2. This expression is uh, quite similar to the amplitude of the one of the waves and then we have a factor 2 comes in the picture here ok. And then this term cos 2 pi x into k1 minus k2 by 2 ok, its value is going to decide how as a function of uh, distance x ok, the amplitude is going to change. That is if we take this value to turns out to be 0 ok, that is for this cos value to be turn out to be 0, then this term 2 pi x into this one, this should be equal to pi by 2, that is the uh, one condition when we can take it. When that becomes 0, then the net amplitude essentially turns out to be just equal to uh, 0. This is one way in which the definition like the way we have defined it earlier. The other definition is that if the value of cos 2 pi x into k1 minus k2 by 2, okay. if this value turns out to be half then what it will happen? Then in this case the psi will turn out to be a into sin 2 pi k1 x by 2. So this is nothing but equivalent to that one of the waves. So that means that uh, there is neither increase nor decrease in the wave amplitude and it remains the same as the original one. So for this condition to be satisfied, okay, then this term has to turn out to be equal to pi by 3, okay. That is we know that cos uh, uh, 60 equals half, that is cos pi by 3, okay. That means that 2 pi into x into k1 minus k2 by 2 should be equal to uh, pi by 3. So corresponding to uh, this value since we know k1 and k2 okay, it will uh, 1 by lambda 1 and 1 by lambda 2. Now we can uh, find out the value for this distance x. This x corresponding to this particular value turns out to be the coherence length. Okay. That is the uh, distance up to which okay, when two waves with slightly different uh, with slightly different wavelengths but having the same frequency uh, but having the uh, same phase okay uh, at uh, what distance okay the uh, amplitude of the wave becomes the same as that of that incident wave that distance is called as the coherence length okay this distance will turn out to be nothing but lambda squared by 3 delta lambda. This delta lambda will be nothing but lambda 1 minus lambda 2 and uh, since lambda 1 is nearly equal to lambda 2, this is written as equal to lambda. That is how we derive this expression Lc equals lambda squared by 3 lambda. So this is an another way in which the coherent coherent length is defined. This we call it as the temporal coherence length. This is the uh, distance over which when the waves travel, okay, uh, the uh, interference vanishes. This is exactly that uh, same derivation which has been shown. From this, uh, the coherence time which we can write it uh, tau c equals 
the covariance length divided by okay, it is not 2 uh, divided by just C that is equals L C by C this will turn out to be roughly 1 by 3 delta F okay. and uh, this one can just do the simple derivation which is shown here. Okay. So, tau C becomes delta F uh, tau C into delta F is almost of the order of 1 or slightly less than 1. And uh, what is the experiment which we can do to find out this uh, uh, coherency? One of the experiment is essentially the Michelson centrophorometer which has been used to find out this coherent length. What is essentially done here is that uh, we have a monochromatic source of light okay, and light is traveling in this direction. We have kept a partially uh, uh, reflecting uh, mirror here. Okay. So, the ray pass through this and part of the ray because this kept at 45 degree part of the ray is uh, reflected. We have kept an another fully mirrored uh, uh, fully reflecting mirror is kept here and another fully reflecting mirror is kept here okay. and both these distances kept are kept initially the same okay. and then we find that uh, these two waves uh, which has been split from here they travel the same distance and come back and they join here once they come here and we should be at if we keep a screen here we should be able to see an interference pattern okay. And here we will see that the pattern which we see okay. What we can do it is this mirror the distance we can just gradually go on changing it. That means that we can uh, change the path difference continuously okay. So, as we change the path difference because when the phase difference is that same there is an amplitude increase okay and so we will be getting an interference pattern and when the uh, distance we go on increasing it for a particular distance okay as the distance increases we find that gradually as we can see the d is 0 this distance and this gap as it is uh, being increased we can see that the intensity of the constrictive and the destructive interference will come down that we can make out from here as that x changes okay for a constant value the this amplitude factor now here becomes this can be written as sin 2 pi k 1 x by 2 into 2 a cos 2 pi k 1 minus k 2 by 2 into x okay. This is the amplitude term depending upon that value of x or the distance d which we use it this term will be changing okay. And as the value of d becomes very large for at a critical value we find that interference pattern completely disappears okay. This distance d a is uh, related to the uh, coherence length okay. This way we can find out what is the uh, temporal coherence uh, uh, length okay of the beam that is what is the uh, path difference over which okay even when we say that the beam is monochromatic okay because in an ideal case if we say that the, the beam is perfectly monochromatic at any distances a constructive and destructive interference should take place. But we find that in reality there is a, a line width which is associated with it that puts a limit on what is the distances over which this constructive and destructive interferences could be seen beyond which we will not be seeing the interference pattern okay. That is what information we can get it from that Michelson interferometer experiment. Other important aspect which is especially important in the case of electron microscopy is spatial coherence. What do we mean by spatial coherence? That is uh, if that is a light is emitted from one particular point and the light is emitted from an another particular point at that source okay. Will the photons which are emitted from various points all of them will be in phase or not normally need not be okay. What is the distances over which okay the spatial coherence could be maintained okay. This uh, information 
okay, uh, can be obtained using uh, Young's double slit experiment is one example, one experiment which we can use to get information about it. What is being done here is a point source from which the light is being emitted okay, and uh, two slits are there. So, when the light reaches here, it is a we can assume that the spherical wave waves are being emanated from each of these. So, at these two points if you look at it, both of them will have the same phase relationship okay. and uh, then these waves interfere okay. and uh, because from here to here at different points when the waves come from both the slits there is a path difference which is introduced and so we it gives rise to an interference pattern. The question which arises is that this is some distance d which we have maintained. If we go on increasing this distance d, will we be seeing that the same type of an interference pattern 1 and will the uh, amplitude of the constructive and destructive interference will remain that same or not or for some particular distance d, will this pattern itself will vanish. Uh, this the experiments show that as the d is being increased the intensity of this uh, uh, constructive and destructive one they gradually start decreasing okay. at some particular separation they completely uh, vanish. Okay. This decides the spatial coherence okay. Okay. and uh, that area corresponding that is pi d dash squared this is the critical distance d at which the spatial coherence is lost. And this is given by this formula. Okay, we will just look at the derivation a little bit later. Okay, essentially, the uh, spatial coherence or the separation between the two slits is given by the formula 0 0.16 lambda is the wavelength of the radiation, L is the distance from the source, and delta is the source width. Okay, and here we assume that the beam is a perfectly monochromatic beam, but it is a wide source. So, as the size of the source increase, uh, increases, we can make out uh, that uh, the DC decreases that means that the spatial coherence becomes poorer and poorer and as the wavelength increase the DC increases, as the separation from the of the uh, slit from the source is increased okay, then also the uh, spatial coherence. Uh, DC is increasing it. This is one of the reason when we find that though the sunlight when we comes from the uh, sun and similarly the light comes the stars we say that light from the stars are coherent not from the sun because the sun is much closer to us whereas the stars are very far away though the size of the star is much bigger okay. Still we can uh, using the form we find that because the distance is very large the DC turns out to be very high okay. So, the spatial coherence is quite high okay. We will just look at this uh, derivation okay. Uh, this is the size of that source okay. A beam which starts from both the ends of the source extreme ends if you consider it when they come and meet at the middle of this uh, uh, these ends the slits are there the beam can come. And here if we consider it at this particular point the path difference turns out to be 0. But from here to compare to a ray which starts from here and reaches here that introduces a small path difference and that path difference uh, will turn out to be uh, this distance d by 2 into sin theta. Similarly, the ray which comes from here from the center to this one this introduces an another path difference minus d by 2 sin theta. So, essentially if we look at the path difference between the rays this one which emanates from here and which one which comes from here and meet here the path difference turns out to be d sin theta okay. And similarly we can find out the path difference. So, the total path difference between this and this finally turns out to be uh, 4 pi d sin theta by lambda okay. This is what the total path difference which turns out to be. Corresponding to this we can find out an, uh, the phase difference. Okay. When this phase difference turns out to be as we have looked at it expression this phase difference turns out to be equal to pi by 3 and uh, that value corresponding to that if we calculate this the d value turns out to be 1 by 6 into lambda into L by d uh, L by delta 
this is what essentially we have seen. So, from this what we can make out is that if the beam is being made as the source width is reduced okay, the spatial coherence length okay, even if the separation between the waves uh, spatially is quite large still an interference can take place okay, that is very important or if the source is at a very long distance then also the spatial coherence is uh, enhanced or the width of the source is like a point source if we take it then also the sp spatial coherence is enhanced. This is what we can uh, uh, infer from this transparency. Here one example is that thrown this is a light source okay. it is an inherent bulb which is emitting uh, tungsten bulb which is emitting uh, photons okay. at different point photons are being generated with different wavelengths and different uh, frequencies. Okay. If you put a spatial filter, spatial filter is nothing but a uh, uh, aperture with a very, a very small size hole in it when we put it like a point source the light is coming from here. Though the wavelength is different okay, this source become highly spatially a coherent source okay. and to this but the beam is a polychromatic beam and to which if you put a filter then we can get a monochromatic beam which also is exhibits high spatial coherence. Okay. If the line width of the radiation turns out to be very small then this beam can exhibit very high temporal uh, coherence as well. So, both spatial and temporal coherence can be obtained even from sources which are incoherent by uh, putting an aperture and using different types of uh, uh, layer spectral filters. Okay. In this table I am just showing some examples of uh, uh, sources okay, uh, and uh, what is the coherency which they exhibit. Okay. If you take a sunlight which is unfiltered the wavelength of the sunlight is from 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 micron. Okay. This corresponds to a frequency of 3.74 and uh, the tau c the coherence length corresponding to this separation turns out to be 2.61 femtosecond and this gives the coherence length is only 800 nanometers. So, if you wanted to get any interference pattern okay, this is the distance by the time the light has traveled this distance from the source already the coherency has been totally lost this is the distance over which the coherency is being maintained. Okay. If you take a light emitting diode okay, this is uh, lambda 0 equals 1 micron delta lambda then it is about 20 micron is the coherent length and if you take the uh, sodium vapor lamp we can get a coherence length of about 600 micron. Okay. If you take a multimode neon laser then the coherence length turns out to be 20 centimeters. If we take a single mode helium neon laser then the coherence length turns out to be 300 meters. That means that uh, whatever be the path difference which are being uh, introduced still the interference patterns could be obtained using this uh, uh, beam. Okay. What are the applications of uh, this coherence? Uh, because suppose we wanted to collect signals from uh, which are coming from uh, different uh, uh, stars okay uh, from space then many radio telescopes are used to collect the signals okay to enhance that intensity then there are very large array of uh, telescopes are kept some particular distances so that a phenomenon of coherence could be used to uh, add up the all the signals which are coming from each of them then in uh, optical coherence tomography is one which used in biomedical imaging okay then in lithography uh, it is being used, Michelson interferometer which I had explained. Then holography is another technique where uh, coherent beam is very much necessary especially in uh, wanted to look at the uh, magnetic structures okay, or uh, uh, ferroelectric materials in an electron microscopes. Okay. We can use this uh, holography technique to create interference pattern and get information about it for which uh, the, the spatial coherency of the beam is 
very much important. Okay. Having said so far what we talked about coherency in terms with respect to an electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Now let us talk about uh, coherency in a electron microscope where exactly it is necessary because the types of source of uh, uh, electrons are either tungsten filament or LAB6 filament, lanthanum hexaboride filament or short key FEG or cold FEG. These are all the filaments which are being used. The work function corresponding to each of them are given here. Okay. What is going to be the Richardson's constant and the operating temperatures at which the filaments are operated. Tungsten is operated 2700, lanthanum hexaboride 1700, short key FEG is 1700 Kelvin and the cold emission, uh, cold field emission gun is operated 300 kV. You can make out that the tungsten, the current density is very poor whereas in the case of cold uh, short key, cold emission, the current density is uh, almost around 10 to the power of 5 to 10 to the power of 6 times that of a, uh, a tungsten filament. Okay. Brightness also similarly you can see that increases, but what is essentially important is that when we talk about monochromaticity of a beam because the monochromaticity of the beam determines the temporal coherence. Okay. That in the case of uh, tungsten filament it is about 3 electron volt okay. and whereas in LAB6 it is around 1.5, short key FEG it is 0 0.7 and cold emission this one 0 0.3. From this we can immediately make out that the field emission guns the uh, beams exhibit higher temporal coherence. Okay. Other than that what is uh, one more thing which is essentially important is that what is the uh, area from which this uh, electrons are emitting from the electron source size. Here if we look at it, it is around 10 to the power of 5 nanometers, here it is around 10 to the power of 4, here it is about 15 nanometers here it is about 3 nanometer. That is we can make out that the source is becoming uh, smaller and smaller okay, and with a very high brightness current density and also if you look at the energy spread is becoming small. So far field emission guns we have got very high spatial as well as temporal coherency is uh, there. Why this coherency is necessary? Because in an electron microscope essentially all the contrast which we look at it is essentially a some sort of a phase contrast microscopy. So where the phase di difference is being changed into an uh, amplitude variation. So in such cases the coherency of the beam is very important. Then the other case where the coherency is very important is that when we look at the diffraction pattern is essentially is nothing but interference of uh, uh, coherent beams okay, which are uh, interacting with atoms in crystal structures which are at some uh, periodic distances. Here again the coherency of the beam is very much necessary okay. and in both the counts if you look at it field emission guns have got high spatial as well as uh, high temporal uh, coherency. And, uh, uh, Apart from the coherency, if you look at that uh, uh, resolution of the microscope also, which we discussed uh, 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 in some uh, earlier classes, there we had seen that the uh, resolution is also being affected by the energy spread. The energy spread enhances the chromatic abrasion of the microscope and in the field emission gun, the chromatic abrasion is reduced considerably, which is the one. Uh, the next question which comes is that though field emission gun has got a very high spatial as well as a temporal coherency, okay, uh, which is the one which is really important in the case of a uh, transmission electron microscope. Okay. Here would the formulas which we have derived that is being given here. Okay. In the case of a microscope we can make out that uh, LC is the coherence length, temporal coherence length. Okay. Delta E is 0 0.3 to 3 EV for different electron beam sources for 100 to 400 keV initial energy of the electron beam. Okay. For 100 keV if we consider delta E equals 1 electron volt 
LCEs of that rough about roughly 1 micron ok. But the temporal coherency is not that important in the case of a microscope, but the spatial coherency is very much important. But the temporal coherency is very important in, in a particular type of a microscope which we use it. This is called as the technique which is called as is electron energy. This is electron energy loss spectroscopy. Okay. About this technique, I will be talking about it uh, later, but I will just mention here what it means. Okay. So, that what is the relevance of uh, this uh, temporal coherency, we will understand it at this juncture. Okay. In electron energy loss spectroscopy, when electron with a specific energy is falling onto the sample, okay, some inelastic scattering can take place. So, electrons from a particular level for an atom, electron from a particular level, k level can be knocked out. Suppose this is the energy of the electron. So, if that electron is knocked out from an atom sitting here and then the energy of the electron which comes out will be E minus E k is the energy with which the electron will be coming out. So, since we know the initial energy, okay, since we have measured this particular energy of the electron which is coming out, then we can find out what is going to be E k. This is characteristic for each of the element okay, and this information could be used to identify the various elements which are present on the sample surface. Okay. So, if the energy spread is going to be large, okay, the accuracy with which we can measure this E k will turn out to be small. If the energy spread is very small, we can measure this value E k. So, hence in this case the temporal coherency is very important or what we essentially means that the beam should be as monochromatic as possible. In many microscopes in addition to the uh, sources, we can put a special filter to bring down the uh, spread in the beam that is what it has been done. More details about this spectroscopy we will talk in a later class. The spatial coherency this is the formula which we have derived dc equals 0 0.16 lambda l by d okay. and this uh, uh, l by d will turn out to be nothing but the angle alpha that is if you have a source which is here and this is where the width which we look at it. Okay. And what is the angle this it makes with respect to this angle is what is called as alpha. This depends upon this distance the source width delta and this distance L that is what essentially is being given. Okay. And as we could make out that uh, the spatial coherency dc, okay. this distance dc is d or dc is called as the spatial coherency. This is what we have derived some time back okay. and uh, since uh, the lambda is uh, fixed that, uh, that, uh, that can be changed or that can be made smaller by using high energy electrons okay, or increasing the energy of the electrons. Okay. And uh, for a field emission gun the delta becomes very small. Okay. Even for a constant L we can make out that the DC becomes very high. So, the uh, spatial high spatial coherency can be maintained. That consequence of it is that even if the uh, beam okay, is made highly convergent, even then the coherency could be maintained. Okay. Generally when the beam is being made parallel, this angle will turn out to be alpha will turn out to be 0 then what is going to DC is going to be very high. This is the condition which we normally use for diffraction because normally for diffraction what we do? We use a parallel beam. Why we use a parallel beam? Because in that condition the spatial coherence is turning out to be very high. Okay. And FEG what happens is that in spite of uh, uh, even if we use aperture the beam can be converged to a point even then the spatial coherency could be high spatial coherency could be maintained. That is the advantage of having 
and field emission uh, tip gun okay and a direct example of it how we can see the spatial coherency in a material okay uh, the spatial coherency in a transmission electron microscope okay a strong difference which we can see when we use a, a tungsten filament okay the thermionic emission filament where we can make out that the uh, source size is very large okay the spatial coherence is very small okay in this case what is being done is a holy film is a sample that is holy film is nothing but a carbon film in which small holes are there okay around these holes okay when a highly coherent beam which a monochromatic coherent beam which we use it we will be able to see uh, frontal fringes near the edges okay in this case hardly one or two fringes which we could see whereas if we use a field emission gun because the spatial coherence is there a lot of frontal fringes could be seen okay from the edge going inwards this itself is an indication of high spatial coherence okay the importance of this uh, coherence uh, uh, comes in uh, uh, especially high resolution images okay as well as uh, in all conventional images also where essentially the contrast which we get it is we call it as a some sort of a phase contrast okay here i had just tried to explain what is the need for the uh, uh, spatial coherence okay because what will happen is that if you use a thermionic emission gun and try to look at that sample unless the beam is highly parallel perfectly parallel we find that we will not be able to get a, a high uh, fidelity okay uh, high contrast uh, images okay especially high resolution images uh, uh, using thermionic emission but whereas in the field emission gun even if the beam is not parallel okay even if the beam is convergent still we can get okay very good quality images we can obtain that is uh, why we should have uh, high spatial coherence in the microscope here just uh, what i had mentioned about uh, how we calculate the intensity of the uh, when the beams are coherent beams okay in this case essentially amplitudes are added together and then the psi psi star is taken to find out the uh, net intensity whereas in coherent beam for each of the wave we separately calculate the intensity and add together okay uh, i hope in this uh, uh, transparency okay uh, i have made it very clear the importance of uh, uh, having coherent beams i'll stop it here now thank you very much